Hey guys, I'm Wade McNair. Today we're gonna to talk about a very important step in Jesus' Beatitudes. He says it like this, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. We've seen the crucial first steps of acknowledging our spiritual bankruptcy and grieving our sin. Jesus speaks of the meek who are blessed or content or truly happy. We tend to equate meekness with weakness and consider it descriptive of someone who's submissive in a negative sense, slavish, passively, someone who gets walked on. And that's not what Jesus meant at all. But here's the problem. Meek is a hard word to translate in English for all its nuance. There's no equivalent. It's the idea of someone who's given over to a greater authority, namely God, where I relinquish control of myself and begin to be submissive, humble, teachable, and responsive to Him. It's the point where I relinquish control of myself and begin to be submissive, humble, teachable, submissive, responsive to God. It's when selfishness and recklessness begin to be replaced with controlled, gentle spirit. In essence, it is to yield to the Holy Spirit, seeing all anger, lust, and other sin and negative emotions as things that must be replaced under God's control. Meek is the common English rendering of the word, the Greek word, praus, which rhymes with house, which at its root carries the meaning of a wild or powerful animal that's broken by a trainer and brought under control. This, it seems, Jesus' artful description of surrendering to him as Lord and Master. This is what happens when we initially believe in him and receive him, giving him our lives. Let me give you guys an example of what I think it means to be meek. Meek is power under control. And I, the example that Christ uses is of a horse. It's of a horse being controlled and submissive to its trainer. I think about when I was a kid, my mom took my sister and I to learn how to ride horses. And we did this for several months, just learning how to be in control of a horse. When I was young, I was still afraid of this large animal that was much stronger, much faster, and had a will of its own. And when I was trying to ride the horse, it wanted to do what it wanted to do. It wanted to stop and eat. It wanted to be able to run and jump how it wanted to. And the trainer would come over and calm the animal and bring the animal under control so that I, a much younger, smaller child, was able to actually control this horse and get it to do what the trainer wanted to do so that I could ride this horse. And that's the same thing that God wants for us. He wants us to be submissive and understand what His will is, what His purpose is, so that He can guide us because His outcomes and what He seeks for us is much greater than what we would choose to do for ourselves. So surrender is the tipping point. The moment we become gods it does not mean we're wimps or doormats. It means we've rejected our rebellious past and our stubborn insistence on self-determination, that we're in control. We are now all in, loyal, and useful to God. As James 1.21 puts it, Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Again, the word there translated meekness is prowse. The picture is clear that I put away my sin and receive the gospel by surrendering. That is what saves me. Our initial surrender to God is the moment of salvation. The real issue at this point in Jesus' process of the Beatitudes is whether someone has actually believed in Christ, not just believing certain historical, logical, or theological truths about Jesus, but placing faith in Him. I can look at a chair and evaluate through its materials and structures and think to myself that it can support my weight, but I believe and surrender to the chair when I sit in it and rest in it. That's when I place my faith in the chair. And believing in Jesus, surrendering to Him as Lord is similar. It's trusting Him. It's putting your weight on Him. This is a critical question, especially in the South, where many have believed or is cultural Christianity without surrendering to him. Many have considered truthful certain facts about Jesus as a person, his work, that he lived, that he died, but have never been broken by him as a horse is broken by its master. Their sinful nature is still in control. 
Is your sinful nature still in control? Are you under the command of the Lord? Is he able to use you and teach you and train you as he wants to go? We have to deny ourselves and follow him in order to do that. Our identity is in him. Jesus said, if anyone wants to be my disciple, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Later, he said to Peter, who had pointed out that the disciples had left everything to follow him, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the sake of the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. That was Mark 10, 29 through 30. So when you think of the Greek word praus, surrendered, is a perfect description for the person who has genuinely experienced regeneration, places emphasis on the fact that someone has actually received Christ, is yielding to him as Lord, This is a crucial issue. This is the moment of regeneration, when God saves someone, making alive what was dead. Making a cultural Christian is no Christian at all. If they aren't surrendered to Christ, they miss everything, and Jesus made this clear. He said, those of you who do not give up everything, you cannot be my disciples, Luke 14, 33. This is the transferal of my life my control and my ownership to Christ's. Conversely, without regeneration, it's difficult to imagine a man who otherwise submits wholly to Christ. So this meekness, this surrender, is the next logical step after a man acknowledges his spiritual bankruptcy and grieves his sin. The preparatory steps are gifts of God resulting in a man's answering the call to believe, to find salvation, So, like an untamed stallion, will you surrender to the master's will? Will you take his yoke on you? That's one of the questions that you need to answer for yourself and where you are in your journey. Let's read it again. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The reward Jesus promises for those who are surrendered is that they will inherit the earth. This might seem a little puzzling, at least to me. There's much that this could mean beyond our taking part in Jesus' end times conquest and governance, actually inheriting the earth. It also includes our rightful dominion over earthly creation and our personal rule over dissatisfying blindness we experience when we are slaves to sin. For example, when I was a child, I felt like the world was mine to discover and I was awed by its wonder, looking in creeks, playing in different fields and just exploring the universe. I became distracted as I grew up, which robbed me of my ability to appreciate God's beauty in creation. I was constantly trying to keep up with different tasks and people and jobs, out of control. Surrendering to Christ restored my sense of beauty and wonder. I also realized that it's all God's. He's my Father. And what a sense of confidence that gives me. I have the courage to open up. Where are you? Maybe someone's hearing God's call to surrender to Christ. Perhaps some of you are already surrendered. But here's the thing. Yes, initially surrendering to Jesus is how you're saved. But we must surrender to him every day, asking him to take control, entrusting ourselves to him, putting our lives and our days in him. Just like that horse, each time its rider mounts up. Has there been a time in your life when you surrendered your life to Jesus? Tell the group about that moment. What were some of the changes you experienced after you surrendered? Would any of you like to surrender to Jesus now? What are some of the struggles you've had since you surrendered to Jesus? What does that look like in your daily walk? Depending on how God moved in your group, encourage them to share and close in prayer. 